is a project statement. So you have five story parking structure. The story height is 11 feet. And then also I give you the code, which is the CBC and the ABC, because this is actually, the actual project is in the city of Los Angeles, downtown. This is between third and fourth and between LA and Main Street. If you guys know where is this location at, or maybe you can look it up, you can see a parking structure. This is the one. Um, what we need to do in our scope here, this can be in lieu of the homework, which means um, either that I'm gonna have homework or just give you the project. And since we have the project, I'd like it to be related to an actual uh, building that was put together this parking structure. So we're gonna be doing the precast pre-stress double T's. So we're gonna be designing those double T's and we have very good examples. So we have seen the design of double T's. What we need to do is just to pick one from our tables and just do the complete design for it. Then we're gonna have also beams and then also we're gonna have some columns. I'm not sure if we're gonna have enough time to do the columns. Uh, especially when you have pre-stress columns because you need to have a special software unless you can just do it with some simple analysis. When we come to concrete beams and double T's, we're gonna have also the end of block design. And in the block, we didn't cover it yet, but it's gonna be coming as we have submittals. So instead of having a homework, I'm gonna call it here project submittal. I listed here some of the properties that we're gonna be using. So usually you'd like to make the structure as light as possible. So when it comes to double T's, maybe you'd like to do it out of lightweight concrete. So LT means lightweight concrete and the unit weight could be 110, 115 pound per cubic foot. And what you need to do once you, you pick like a double T section and once you pick let's say 24 inch deep and the width is gonna be, let's say 10 foot or eight feet, you're gonna find out in the table, the weight per linear foot. So there is no effort here to figure out the weight, you know, the self weight of the structure itself. Also, we have the beams. The beams is gonna be 5,000 feet side, but it's gonna be normal weight. So usually if I didn't write next to it that this is your lightweight, you just consider it to be normal weight. Beams, the strength is really required, especially when it comes to shear. Shear is gonna be critical in beams. But for the double T's, it is much lighter. This is why in a project like this, I'm gonna go here with normal weight concrete for the beams and for the double T's, I'm just gonna go with light weight. Just to, because it's gonna be the majority of the weight. If you'd like here to go with normal weight, uh, the total seismic and, and uh, weight of the structure is gonna be really heavy. Uh, for columns, we can use here 6,000 PSI. And for some of the gravity columns here, we can use maybe 3,000 PSI. If you like, it is gonna be, let's say some of the short columns that you don't really need to have high strength. There shouldn't be a problem at all to change the concrete strength for the column. And the reason because um, in precast construction, there is no confusion here if you order certain columns be of certain strength. There shouldn't be a problem at all. In conventional concrete, you'd like maybe to use the same concrete mix. So during construction, there is no confusion between which columns can be uh, based on 6,000, which columns can be based on 3,000. But in terms of this business of pre-stress, this is no problem at all. You can order certain columns to be with lower concrete strength. Uh, the reinforcing bars, conventional reinforcing bars is gonna be the conventional A615. It does need to be A706 for seismic. So we can just use A615 for gravity members. And the strands, certainly I'm gonna be going here with 416, STM 416, the grade 270, the standard one that we use. And absolutely I'd like to stick with half an inch. So it's gonna be half an inch strands. Now, when it comes to loads, I'm gonna say here you have the self weight. Let's say that you start here by designing with a double T. When you do double T design, you have three loads, right? When you do any precast concrete construction or members, uh, first you have the dead load, the self weight. And the self weight, we're gonna get it from the standards. So we're gonna have tables, we pick the appropriate double T, and we just have the weight there as in PSA. 
for PLF, pumping linear fluid of the structure. We need also to have this additional dead load of 10 PSF. So what I need to call this, this can be here the additional dead load. If I may write this kind of comment, you can say this load here, I'm going to call it additional dead load. Or superimposed dead load. So total dead load is going to be equal to the self weight that you can look about from the table plus this additional dead load, which is 10 PSA. Now, this load that you are going to be working on is going to be given as a PLF. So I'm going to say here, dead load is given in company in your foot. But this additional load is going to be 10 PSA. It's going to be per PSA. So what you need to do is to convert this into PLF. And the way to do it, you take this number 10 PSF multiplied by the width of the double T. You see, not very clear. You see, you know what? Hold on. Let's get here to one of the old presentations that we worked on. Like near meter. In a situation like this, the width of this double T is 12 feet. And this here normal weight concrete. And here's the weight. It says here 56 or 677 PLF pump linear foot. So this is actually the weight I need to use. So let's say that you picked another one. This is gonna be most likely 24 inch deep. And the width, let's say, is going to be about, let's say, 10 feet or 12 feet. If I am working with a double T with a width of 12 feet, and I'd like to convert this for additional weight of 10 PSF, so we are write it here. Guys, look in this project here. Additional, did load the 300 pound per linear foot. It was given here to you in PLF. But let's say that I have concrete topping like this, and I need to figure out where is this weight coming from? Or I need to put it for calculate out together. So I'm gonna say in our project, I'm gonna say I have a weight of 10 PSF. You can multiply it here by 12 feet. Why 12 feet? Because when I do the design for this double T, I take the moment of inertia, I take all of these properties for this given double T without the topping. So you're gonna see here on top. And of course, you're gonna have another column here that I just covered, which is gonna be the top properties. So in this case, I'm going to say I have here 120 pound per linear foot. And this is what I'm going to be doing in my project. I'm going to be taking here 10 PSF, which is given as addition did load multiplied by the width of the double T that I'm going to choose from the tables. And say, great. How about the life load? You can say life load is going to be the same thing. If you see here in this midterm, life load was given to you as in PLF. But in your project, now, let me switch here to the project. In your project, as you see here, the livelihood is given as in 50 pounds per square foot. So in this case, let's say that the width was 12 feet, I'm just making up a number here. So I'm gonna say my livelihood is gonna be equal to 50 times 12. is going to be 600 pounds in a foot. Does it make sense? Hello, anyone here? Yeah, yes. Okay, great, all right, very good. So with that, I know exactly how to figure out total dead load and total life load. So I have your three loads again. I have the self weight, I have additional dead load, and they have the life load, and each one of them is going to be as a pound per linear foot. So this gives be the service loads. So if you have been asked the question about 
balancing, let's say 75% or 80% or 90% of the self-weight. You're gonna be doing pays on the self-weight only, right? And you're gonna be working the service level. But once it comes to an actual design, like the way we have done it before in the previous slide set, you need to figure out the ultimate dead load. An ultimate dead load by just applying the factors. The very same, very similar to what we do here in conventional concrete design. Now let me uh, go to the project. I'm gonna say here, let's look here at submitted number one. So in submittal number one, this gave you due April 3rd. So you guys, you'll have enough time to work on this. First, it says here, develop the load criteria. So this gave you the first item that you need to do. Developing the load criteria is exactly what I have done in a minute ago. But you need to calculate out as in service, which means that you're gonna have your three loads. And all of them, you're gonna have them as in P left at the end, like pump in inner foot. For dead load, additional dead load and life load. And then when it comes to the double T design, we need this factor loads. So you need to have service loads, dead load, additional dead load, life load, and then factor loads. And for the beam design, you do the same. Now, how would we do the beams? I understand for the double T, I have the width of the double T, I can just use it. So we're gonna start here to open the rest of the files provided to you. Here's the floor plan of level two and level three of the park construction. And as you see here, this is a double T and you see the width of the double T it goes from here to here. So actually this red box is made around one of those double T's. So this area here is kind of flat. This could be kind of landing. And then you have staircase and elevator. And at the bottom here, this is flat, this is flat, and this is a little bit sloping. So if you drive, you just go like this. And then this give you flat, slope up, flat, and then this give you the ramp, flat, and again, then you go and then you just continue. So the double T I'd like to design is give you this double T, no other ones. So someone's gonna say, how about here? What's happening here? I'm gonna say, yeah, you have some double T's. You see it's wrong like this, but I'm not showing everything. I'd like just to take one double T and design it. And this is gonna be good enough. It's gonna be representative. Now, where is the span of the double T? Now I need to figure it out. I guess you can just simply look at this. It's gonna be between grid line E and between grid line A. So it's gonna be from A to E. This is gonna be the span. You can just add these numbers. In this case here, we're not going here beyond 60 feet. So it's gonna be much less. It's gonna be less than 60 feet. You can just add these dimensions and figure out the distance from E to A. So it's gonna be this dimension here. It's gonna be the span of the double T. It's gonna be this distance here. Someone's gonna say, should I take it to the face of support, face of the beam? This gonna be the supporting beam. You can say no, you can just take it from center of from center of the beam to center of the beam, which is gonna be fine. In here, this is gonna be the double T, and then you're gonna have here a beam supporting the double T, another beam supporting the double T, and then you have this columns. So, all right, how about here? You can say this beam here, as you see, it is dashed, and it happens below the double T. And this gonna be in detail 10. So let me remind you here to open detail 10 and see in this sheet. In here, you need to have a parapet, like a guard drain. And this one we call the ear spandrel. So we're gonna be looking at this detail. This is gonna be the one that has a parapet. Otherwise, I mean, it's gonna be dangerous to drive here. 
So this beam is gonna be flat. Why? Because this is like a landing. So this area here is flat. This beam also here is flat, but this beam here is sloping because this is the ramp going up. And this side here, I have two beams. This beam is going up and this beam is going down because you have here two ramps. This ramp is going up this way, right? And this ramp also is going up this way. So these two beams, you don't happen in the same place. Like one of them is going like this, the other one is going like this. One is going up, one is going down. This one also here, it needs a spandrel, it needs a parapet. But this one doesn't need because it's going to be right below the entire slab. So you're going to have your different beams that you're going to be working with. So if I like to design a beam here, I need to pick a beam for my design. And each beam is going to be simply supported. So someone here is going to say, well, I'd like to take this beam and just design it because it's going to, the whole thing here is going to be below the double T's. I'm going to say this is fine. What span are we talking about? I'm going to say the span here is going to be 27 feet. But I need first to figure out how much is the load per linear foot on this beam. You can say, this is not tough. If you have the span here from center to center, like the span of the double T, you're going to say this beam here supports half of the load coming from here to there. You say, okay, let me just do it this way. So I'm going to say, see here, this is going to be the ramp going up. Half of it, I'm going to say, let me take here this line. It's going to be almost um, one half of the span of the double T. I'm going to say, this is going to be the tributary width, which means one half of the double T span. This is going to be supported by this line of beams. And this beam here is going to be supporting one half of this side. And don't forget that here I have two beams, while this beam here, which is in the middle, is going to be supporting this tributary width. So tributary width for this beam that I'd like to design, this is going to be my beam to design, is going to be equal to the total distance from grid line H to A divided by 2. So I'm going to say this distance here is going to be equal to W and tributary width for this. I'm going to say here tributary width for this beam is going to be equal to, I'm going to say it's going to be equal to W divided by 2. Am I correct, W divided by 2? Yes? Or I'm wrong? I need your help. Yes, you're correct. correct because then the other. The other beam takes the rest of the load. Yeah. So what I'm saying is, even if the distance from A to E is different from the distance from E to H, right? It means I'm supposed to take one half of A to E and one half from E to H, which means one half of the total width. If this makes sense to you guys. So I can just take here the total width W from A to H, just divide by two, it's going to be to width. Now, what should I do next? Now I need to figure out the load on this beam. So I'm gonna say, I have here three loads on the beam. So I'm gonna say here, beam load criteria. All right. I have dead load, which means self-weight, additional dead load or superimposed dead load. And then I have life load. Dead load equals to what? Equals to W, which is the width times. Dead load coming from the double, D, double T design. You see, but the double T design, do I have it in PSF? Because this load here is going to be in PSF, right? You say, yes. Let's go back here to our exam. It is the example we have. It is true. Now, I guess by now you are looking at your exam, the midterm. It's true that I have the weight as in pump linear foot, but also I have it as in PSF. So when it comes to the load that I need to use, if I need here to develop the load criteria for the beam, I can just use a 56 piece set. If this gave you a choice, right? But I know I'm not gonna pick up this one. I'm not gonna go here with the 28 inch. And when it comes to the additional dead load, I'm gonna be using the 10 piece set. When it comes to the life load, I'm gonna be using the 50 piece set. 
So, okay, now let me go back to this. You see here, this PSEF is going to be taken from the table and is going to be also PSEF. Superimposed dead load is going to be equal to W times 10. Why? Because it's going to be 10 PSEF. You multiply by the width, now it's going to be P left of the beam. Same thing for the life load. You can say life load equals the width W in feet times 50 PSEF. Now, the final answer here is going to be P left. And this can be the beam load criteria as for dead load, superimposed dead load, life load. Right after, I need to find out the ultimate. To do the ultimate, ultimate is going to be 1.4 times dead load. In this case, dead load is not just the self weight, it's going to be self weight plus superimposed dead load. Remember to do this. It's going to be 1.4 times the total dead load versus 1.2 dead, which means for both of them, plus 1.6 times this live load has a P left over. Are we good? Questions? Any questions? So you said 1.4 1, 1. total dead load times, what's the multiplier for the live load? Um, all right. Load factors. If you recall load factors, let me show it to you. If you give me a second, I'm gonna show it to you. Sorry, I have a, a lot of noise going on here in my house right now. So I didn't no worries, hear no worries, right. no worries. No worries. You're good. Now you look here at this one, right? You're looking at the submittal number one. You can say at certain point, I'm going to have the following. You can say addition dead load plus the dead load, which is a self weight and life load. So you can say, how would I do the load factors? You can say in either one of these two, in both of them, you can say W ultimate equals 1.4 times dead load. Now, my dead load in this case is going to be dead load plus addition dead load versus W ultimate. I'm going to take the larger of these two equations, right? 1.2, I'm going to say, here we go. Now it's going to be dead load plus additional dead load, which means total dead load plus 1.6 life load. The two standard equations, you know, for the load criteria that you use for ultimate, and this is going to be paid in chapter 16 of the CBC. And with that, you have now the double T load criteria and the beam design load criteria. You remember now which beam? It's gonna be the beam supporting one half of the total width of the building, which is the most loaded beam in this project. And for the double T, it's gonna be also the long span, which means one half of the total width of the building, if you like. Any questions? Yes. I thought one side of the beam was going up and the other side was going down. Yes, this is so correct. Is, there, is that where the ramp? You, you are absolutely correct. This is a correct statement. One side is going up, one side is going down. But also let me remind with you of this. So what, the part that goes up is going to be this side, this is one ramp, and this is another ramp. But this area here is flat. Oh, I'm Remember, sorry. This is flat? Yeah. Just like a landing. I, I thought it was a little bit lower. My bad. No, no worse, no worse. But when you look at the other side of the building, this is going to be flat, and this flat, and this is a little ramp. You see this? It goes up this way, only from here to there, for this little piece. This is why you have here two beams, right? So one is going up, which is this ramp. And it's going to be a very slight distance from here to here that goes up. And after that, it comes flat. Any questions? What is the, in that drawing, there looks like there's kind of an angle to the, the yeah. edge. What, what, is, what is that describing or what is that? At the uh, bottom here? Detail, yeah, what is that? You, you mean, um, okay, let me just move this here. 
Are you talking about why this is sloping this way? Yes, exactly. Well, this is like the plan view of the project, right? So mm -hmm. um, you don't have this luxury of making this a straight because this is here's the property line. So this is actually one street is right here. I see. Yeah. So I mean, That's... you cannot just leave. Let's say this. This is about let's say this here twenty two feet. You don't want to leave like like eight feet, right? Mm. And to, to just to the street, what's going to happen there? I mean, you can park another car, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. It's good area here that you need it at least. If even if you're not going to park here. You need it for maneuvering and just making this a little bit wider, you know. I see. So it's a site constraint rather than it. yeah, yeah. So this is because of the site. Absolutely, you're correct. And because of the site, just you know, we had um, nine buildings in this project, on this uh, on this lot, in this uh, big. I mean, in this property, and this is actual building number eight. That's why you see here eight in a circle, and then you see the grid line B because it's going to be building eight so that we know that we are going to be within building eight once we just look at it. And um, um, as you see here, someone's going to say, why do you have a small ramp here? We don't really see this in lots of parking structures, right? We just see this to be flat, most likely. Now, no one usually would do it this way, but we have an issue here for this distance, for the length, to the length of the building. It's kind of tight. And you need to have a flat landing and a flat landing somehow right and then you need to have the ramp to take you from this point to this point ideally in five and a half feet because the total story height is going to be here 11 feet so when you go here 11 feet this is going to be five and a half this is going to be five and a half and once you apply this five and a half you're going to see here that this ramp is going to be very steep it's not going to work so this is a reason that we have a third ramp because it's also also a good question, right? Someone's gonna say, "How come that you have a third ramp? We don't see this in lots of projects." And actually, that that was a problem because of this beam here, the geometry of this beam is just weird. It's kind of this beam is it needs to be also sloping, right? Because this ramp is sloping, it just goes up. Right. Yeah. So this is actually that was kind of really bad when it comes to construction and put the precast elements together. So. Yeah, that's not off the shelf, right? That's... Yeah, I mean, this is like, uh, that, that was not an easy project to do that precast. If this is cast in place, it's gonna be much easier, but when cast in place and you slope the ramp is also tough. This is not an easy task to do. Yeah, it's a hard pour. Yeah, but this is like the side constraints, like what you said, and we have to live with it. You need to work with it. You have no other options. Great, no problem. Um, let's look here at the submittal. Continue with the submittal. It says you designed the double T. Okay. It turned out that the span of the double T is 64 feet, a little bit over 60. So, and we should be able to design it. And it says here, consider 24 inch deep double T. Now, is the 24 inch, does this include the concrete topping? I'm going to say no. So when you look it up, when you look up the double T's, you're going to see here that this 28 inch does not include the concrete topping. This concrete topping here is two inches, which is the shaded area. I don't want you here to think about the flat thickness. No, I'm talking here about this topping here. It is not part of this depth. This is going to be here 28. Now, the one that you're going to be choosing is going to be 24 inch. So you're going to be looking in the book you're going to be looking for a double T, and instead of 28 inch, you're going to see here 24 inch. And instead of the 12 feet, it's going to be eight feet. And it is going to be lightweight concrete instead of normal weight concrete. So it's an easy test that you should be able to find it and just pick it up and use it. Once you pick it up, you can just do uh, like cut and paste, and you can just take this double T section with all the properties. So the properties are solved. You don't, I mean, there is no sweat about working with these properties. Now, let me go back here to the product submetal. It says here, the flange width is gonna be eight feet. This means when you do the load criteria, you take the 10 piece F, additional dead load, multiply by this width eight feet. And the same thing for the life load, when you do 
the double T load criteria. It says here the strands are anchored at the CG location at the supports. Meaning, if I have here, the double T is gonna be running like this with the 64 feet. And the CG here is gonna be, let's say, a little bit up. The strand is gonna be here and it's gonna be going like this. This gave me the CG location. How would I know the CG location? I'm going to ask you go back to the properties. Very similar to what we have done in our meter. It's going to be right in the CG of it. So I was going to say, I don't remember because I don't have now the meter on me. So I'm going to say, hold on. Let me show it to you. You see here, Y bottom? Y bottom means what? This is going to be the location of the CG from, this is going to be the CG which is a centroid location. And this Y bottom is giving the distance from here, from the bottom of the double T to the centroid. And Y top is giving from here. Just be careful where exactly we go to. See this, this give you Y top. Not including the topping, the concrete top. And this one, it goes to the bottom of the double T. Meaning here is Y top. Is going to be this distance here. And this is actually Y bottom. So let me remind you of what you have seen here in your meter. It says your location of the strands center from the bottom of the double T to be as follows. Four inches in the center and 20.01 inches at each end. Why did I pick 20.01? Because I made it to match this. Just made it to match this. So now at each end, the strand is going to be right at the CG of the double T. And in the middle, I made it at four inches. So let's see here what happened in our project. In our project, it says it's going to be three inches in the bottom, which means this is going to be at three inches. Or maybe I can just type it here. It says here three inches. And then here is going to be right at the CG. And here is going to be at the CG, which is going to be very similar to what we have done in our meter. It says here the maximum balanced load is nearly 90% of the double T self-weight. So here you need to balance 90%. So now I hope that your the spreadsheet is ready so that you can do it in an easy way and you don't have to do lots of analysis by hand. Maximum is going to be 90%, but it needs to be an even number. Why? Because WD it has two legs. So let's say that you ended up by going, let's say, seven and a half. Can you use seven? You can say, no, I cannot use seven because seven is going to be an odd number. Can I use eight? Just push it to eight. I'm going to say, if you put eight, you're going to be balancing more than 90%. So we can say, in this case, I need to use six, six strength. Of course, this six or seven or eight, just number I'm throwing here to you guys for sake of discussion, but this is not the right number that you need to use in this design. It says here, note that the balanced load ratio was selected to avoid camber of the floor surface. So I don't want to do lots of camber, right? I don't want it to camber after I apply all dead load and before I put life load. For the double T design, it says here, determine the proper number of strands. Of course, it's going to be based on balancing. Item number two, check the stresses at the initial stress and service load. I said, okay, I know how to do this. When it says here, check the stresses means compare it to the code limits. And you have the code limits in the slides. There shouldn't be a problem at all. And then it says also check the flexure capacity. So based on this location, I want you here to find PMN. And I guess you guys know how to do it. Now, which method would you use when it comes to FPS? You remember FPS? Do I need to do it with detailed analysis? I'm going to say no, use a code equation. Anyone remembers the code equation? Yes? No? No for me. 
not on top of your head. It's I'm not based on ratio of the speeds. Yeah, I'm not expecting that you guys know it on the top of your head, but do you remember there's a code equation and detailed method? I'm going to say, yeah, here we go. Where is the code equation? Here we go, FPS, right? There is two methods of doing it. Either that you use this equation, and of course you can use some top reinforcing if you like, maybe three or four bars number five in the double T, maybe like, like number five at 12 inch on the top, if you want to, I mean, this is fine. Would you like to consider a couple of rebars at the bottom, like AS, do you want to add maybe one rebar? I'm going to be okay with it. If you add one rebar in each, maybe number five or maybe two number five at the bottom in the whip itself, I'm going to be okay with it. I mean, it's going to be up to you. So you can use this equation instead of using this detailed method. If you guys recall the detailed method, yeah, I don't want to use this detailed method. I don't want to use this. I'd rather just use a code equation. You say, okay, this could be the flexure capacity. How about M ultimate? You say M ultimate. I have W ultimate, but where is M ultimate? You say, yeah, I can figure out M ultimate. Because when you check the flexure capacity, it means that you check it against the demand. You say this M ultimate equals W ultimate times L squared. You just do it this way, divide by eight. How much was the span in this product? Anyone recalls? The span L? 64. Yeah, let's give you this one. W ultimate, let's give you the larger of this two. And this give you your M ultimate. And don't forget at the end, you need to report it then. Your foot, right? And your capacity also is giving your foot. So be sure that you put everything here in your foot when you do the comparison. All right? Some notes. Try to use here Excel spreadsheet just to make your life easier. If you do a mistake, at least you can trace it back. When you submit, submit the PDF and Excel sheet. Because in many cases, if I just look here at the Excel sheet, and let's say that you have a few columns, I'm not going to figure out the order. So please be sure that you submit both of them. If you are planning to do all hand calculations, in this case, there is no spreadsheet. This is going to be up to you. You can just use PDF, scan it. And Send it my way. Uh, questions before we are done with this section of the project submission. Uh, can we use MathCat instead of Excel? Yes, absolutely. Great, thank you. Yeah. This is the reason that PDF is going to be very useful. So we are finding the loading criteria for both those beams that we talked about uh, before this, but. When it comes to the design, we're only doing the double T. No, this is the first submit. This just one submit. We're going to be doing the beam. Beam is going to be coming. But I mean, once we start to work on the load criteria, just easy if I ask you to do load criteria for the double T and the beam. Right, right. Okay. Later, second submit is going to be about the beam design. OK. Yeah. Now, another question. Is it OK to work in groups? No. Why not? Good response, but what is the reason? Why don't you guys like to work in groups? Ensure equal contribution. Absolutely. This is a major problem that I see every time in the past. Once you assign group homework or group project that that a few people is gonna come and say, this guy, he never communicate with us. We're just doing all the work and we don't know what to do with him. It's gonna be very typical, very standard. This is why I just decided that I'm not gonna do uh, group projects. Um, just you guys know, group projects is much easier for me because instead of let's say grading 25 homeworks or submittals, I can just do five or so. So it's gonna be much easier on me. But the problem is, in many cases, just unfair 
when you see people that people are working very hard, there are certain people are just carrying the group and some people didn't care. They don't even respond. Do you guys agree with me or do you have a different opinion? Yes. Yeah, agree. Yeah, it happens. Every time it happens. I said, just do it in the video. The good thing uh, that, that most likely I'm going to have one design. So one design is going to be the correct design. And here's the reason. I have one span. I have one double T that you're going to be working with. And I knew the location. I knew that you're going to be supporting 90% of the dead load maximum, which means number of strains needs to be the same for everybody here. It is so easy when you have two submitted that you can compare the way it is answered. Usually, mistake is getting repeated, you know? So you can figure out who's doing what, who's working with whom. <laughs> uh, should I move forward to the lecture? We're done here with the submitted, right? With the project, unless you guys have any other questions. I'd like to see here, we are exposed to, generally speaking, pre-stress members. And we have seen now a partner structure, pre-stress partner structures composed of double T's and beams. And one of the things also that I need to show you here, maybe it's gonna be the beam sections. Did you guys see the beam sections of the double T sections that you are working with? Have you seen it already while I was going through the project? Yes, no? Can you get a good look at it? Okay. Let me show you this for quick before we move. Here's the beam that you are gonna be working on. So actually this gave you like the beam section. Here's one double T, another double T, and this gives you your beam that you're going to be designing. This area here is flat. You have double T coming from each side of it. Double T section. It's going to be a little part of the double T. Just it continues this way. And this gives you the one, the beam with a spandrel, like a guard rail. And most likely the height from here to there is going to be 42 inches. Uh, it's going to be like three and a half feet, very standard. And this concrete topping, actually, we use it as a diaphragm. When it comes to seismic, we use this as our diaphragm. So it has some reinforcing. This is why it says here cord and drag bars. Cord and drag bars you use going to be for seismic. And the double T here is supported on this beam. So the beam works as a beam, and then it has a spandrel. Um, some of these cases we have blanks like whole core, you know. In some cases we have masonry supporting the top of this spandrel. And in some other cases we have blanks supported by the masonry wall. Right? And this gave you the wall for the staircase. And it shows here some details. It's not really, it's gonna be within your scope when it comes to uh, your submitted one or two or three. We're not gonna be working on mystery design, but as you guys know, this is taken here from an actual project. This why it has all of this, all of these details, if you like. Moving forward. Now we have seen by now an example of an actual project. And this actual project is gonna be, as we said here, precast park construction. Now we'd like to see some bridge concrete girders and beams. And we have done already a design for a precast 
bridge beam. And this is actually the example that we have last time. So last time in the, in the slide sets, the design that we have is actually for bridge beam. So here's a standard like an eye girder. We call this California eye girders. And you see here that this gives be cross section through the entire bridge. You have barriers or you have a spandrel at the end. You have like a parapet. And here's the clear width from curb to curb, like 32 feet. And then you have a few of them at certain spacing. These girders here, most likely they are pre-tensioned. We're gonna cast it in the yard and just transport it to the side. A big crane is gonna be supporting it and you're gonna have two abutments and each abutment you're gonna be resting this concrete girders if you like. And then you're gonna have some formwork. And then after that, you cast a concrete deck of this, um, of this bridge. And most likely you're gonna have some anchorage between the beam and the concrete deck. You're gonna see here some dowels that stick this way. And this dowel is gonna be provided here, the connection between the girder to the concrete deck of the bridge. So most likely this concrete deck, I'm gonna see here in a system like this, I'm gonna say 99% uh, of cases, this is gonna be cast in place, conventional concrete. This is not pre-stressed. And the girders itself is gonna be pre-tension, which means that it's gonna be done in the arc. So here's what happened there. You have a casting bed, which is just concrete slab on grade. You have a concrete slab on grade here. And then you're gonna have an abutment and one abutment here at the end. You're gonna put the strands, you're gonna pull it. And all the compression force that goes here from the strands to abutment is gonna to go to the first and the last abutment. And in between, you can have few girders. It could be two or three, it depends. This intermediate abutment is just put there to brace the strain, just support the strain. And also it, it, it is like a form, if you like, in many cases gonna be right against um, the girder, when they cast it, it's gonna be like part of the girder form. You're gonna put the tension on, on the strength from each, each side and they're gonna put here, this is gonna be the jack and you're gonna have an anchorage here. Then you cast the concrete. And then at certain time, which is, is gonna be like PI, which means initial pre-stress, you're gonna be transferring the force by just cutting the strength here and there and right here and right here and just take the abutments out. Once you cut the strand, all the force now is going to get transferred to the girder. And what's going to happen? The strand here is going to be putting lots of compression on the beam and it's going to start to camper, which is very standard, which we, we discussed before. And of course, loss is going to start to take place. And when loss is going to take place, this camber is going to reduce a little bit. And at this point here, at the initial, transfer of the pre-stressing, you can do check in the stresses. Most likely the top is gonna be exposed to tension and the bottom is gonna be exposed to compression and you need to include here the self weight and the pre-stressing forces at the same time when you check the stresses. When loss is gonna start to take place, camper is gonna get reduced and then they're gonna be carrying the beam, they're gonna be taken to the bridge location or site, put it in place and then later on the poor the additional concrete weight, which is a deck weight in this case, the concrete deck weight for the bridge. We have a table here. We have different type of girders that's commonly used in bridges. And this accord to cantrons, the cantrons design specifications for bridges, which is a copy of ASH2 with the changes that they think is needed for California construction. And for each girder type, you have the possible span length and the preferred, which means this California eye girder, like the one that you're just looking at, it looks like this. They say it can work between 50 to 125 feet, but it's preferred to be within like 100 feet. You don't really want to push it to 120. So they say most likely it's going to be up to 100 feet, should be fine. 
So try to use it between, let's say, 70, 80, 100 is good. It should be able to work up to 125, but maybe you'd rather keep it up to 95. So this is going to be the preferred, which means most likely try to be within this range. But if you really want to push it, you can push it to this range. So at the California eye girder, we, can, we have this bulb T. So you should expect that something's going to happen here in the girder. It's going to get larger a little bit. You're going to have more room for the strength and the compression. You can have here the bed top, and you're going to see how it's going to look like. And this is actually very common. You're going to see this a lot. If you drive somewhere, you're going to see this a lot. And then white flange. I'm looking here at um, the bulb T. Look what happened. You see here, it's like a bulb. You see that this is like bulky here. When you compare it to the white flange, look at the white flange here and look at this. This is like normal, this is like any other flange. But look at this, this is like a big box. So if you, in, in a case like this, you can put really many strands if you want to with some like conventional rebars if you want to. And look here for all of the three bars that sticks up. All of the three bars either comes as a U bar, like it comes like this, or this down here, after you put it in place, what you need to do is just to bend it to the side. And this gives you the connection between the concrete deck. Don't forget the concrete deck is gonna come like this. Concrete deck is giving the top. And you can just bend the three bars, the dowels right and left, put the rebars for the deck and then pour the concrete. So the three bars here is going to provide the connection between the bridge girder and between the bridge deck. And you see here, you have the same thing. You have the same rebars or dowels sticks up of it. But it doesn't require like a hook or a... This one here? No, yeah, because well, actually once you bend it, it's going to be like a hook. It's going to be a 90 degree hook. So you do bend it? You're going to bend it right and left, meaning... Um, if I may get closer here. So this rebar, which is this one, is gonna be like this, and then again, bend it this way. And, and then the rebar. You cast the deck in on top of that? This is a deck. This is a concrete deck. You see this red piece here? Just give it the concrete deck. This one, the mm -hmm. thickness of the concrete deck. So actually, you're gonna bring the rebar, you're gonna bend it right and left, and of course, you're going to be adding some rebars like this, you know? You're going to have a rebar right here at this location, you know? It's going to be like this. And another one also is going to be here. And you have some other rebars throughout. So this one here, you're going to have a hook around the rebar. So you have nine degree hook in this case for the, for the connection of the deck to the concrete girder itself. I see. So it's just not done yet in this picture. No, this is still in the yard. You see, yeah. you have plenty of them, right? You have many of them. Mm -hmm. The bridge, you're not going to put them like this next to each other, right? So where's the span of the deck? You need to space them. You just get you at six feet to eight feet. So this is right next to each other. And look at this, this here in the construction yard, right? This is at the, at the factory. So you just carry it and you move it, you put it on the top of a truck. And actually in a truck, you're gonna see here, the head of the truck is gonna be here and then you're gonna hear here some tail wheels because this is very long. There is no long truck like this. I don't know if you guys have seen this before in one of the highways. It's almost like uh, the ladder trucks that fire departments use, right? Where you steer yeah. from the back and steer from the front. Exactly, <laughs> because really long. You're talking about 100 foot beam. I mean, just imagine 100 foot beam. Look at the table here, like 100 foot beam. Um, which truck are we gonna be using for this? It's also another picture, same as this. It's gonna be for the white flange, which is also very common. And here's the eye girder information. And you have the table here. You just have this table in the counter on design specifications. And they tell you the standard width of it on the top flange or the top bulb. It's going to be 19 inch. You're going to have six, seven inch for the width. All of them, they're going to be all seven inch and six inch for this hunch, three and six. All of this can be constant. 
And the bottom also is going to be constant, six inch and six inch, right? And the bottom also is going to be 19 inch. So the same shape, shape of this, top and bottom is going to be the same. The thing is going to be different from a size to a size is going to be about this D, H, Y top and Y bottom and E and all of that. And here's a girder section. They call this very similar to the steel table, let's say. It's called California I-36, means the depth is going to be 36 inches. And this H is going to be how much? It's going to be, now this going to be the variables, right? Gross section area, the gross area, the I, moment of inertia, Y top, Y bottom, and all of that, the section models and R and the weight. So all what you need is just to pick one of these, right? And then look for the moment of inertia in the section, and here's the weight. So this can be similar to the double T tables, or it's gonna be all similar to the steel table. And the variable here is gonna be this depth. You see here, California I-36, California I-48, 54 means four feet and five, you know? So it's gonna be a very simple table like this. You just pick the, the girder that you like to use. Any questions? You're good? All right, how about the bulb T? What have the bulb T? As you see here, the width of the flange here is gonna be constant, it's gonna be the same. The good thing about this system here, the span of the slab, which means the spacing from a girder to a girder is gonna be larger than what you use here. Because don't forget, the slab is gonna be supported here. So someone's gonna say center to center of the slab is gonna be from here or the deck is gonna be from here to the center of the other beam, right? But the effective span of the of the of the concrete deck of the of the bridge is gonna be from this, this face here all the way to the other face. Now look at this. This here like four feet compared to something like like foot and a half. This like 19, 18 inches. But look at this. This is here four feet. So this here gives you a chance to go to bigger spacing between the girders themselves. Because you have two feet as a support for each from each side of the concrete deck itself. Let's say concrete deck is gonna be like this. So actually the, the actual span starts from here. And this is the reason that we have this bulb. We have this bulb because we're gonna put here lots of strength. You see here location of the strength? And this system here, it's not just pretension. You can use it as pretension as post tension, both of them. And the question is, how is that? What would you do? First, you have all of the strengths, and you have all some conventional rebars, like non pre stress rebars. And for all of that, you have all of the strengths, the smooth circles. And the reason that you have this strength is because you need them to be able to move this bulk T from the fabricator or from the, from the yard to the bridge location. And if you like in your design to do pre-tension and post-tension, you can do this by providing this duct. You see this optional duct? This duct here is gonna be for post-tension. And once you take it to the bridge location, you can put the strand through it and just apply the post-tension force. So this reinforcing that you have in here, in terms of strength and conventional rebar, just to be able to move it from the R to the bridge location and also to support some of the additional dead load, little bit of the additional dead load. But because the spacing between this bridge girders, let's say here's one girder, here's the other girder, the spacing is big, this additional dead load is significant. It's not gonna be a small number, it's gonna be now a larger number. And also the life load on a girder like this gonna be larger than that that you'd use in a small bridge like this. So the use of post tension could be necessary because you don't want to do it in the fabricator, in the, in the location. Otherwise, you're going to be putting here lots of compression and here's going to be lots of tension, means lots of rebars on the top. So first, you're going to put this in place and now you start to add the additional dead load and also you do the post tension. Same thing, it's called here California bulk T. And you have the same size, 49. What's 49? It means 49 inch deep. And this gave you your variables. This gave you the variables, but this 47 and quarters give you the same. Seven and seven eighth of an inch is giving you the same for all of this system, for all of this bulk team. 
Okay, that was the second one. The third one is the bath tub. I'm sure that you guys have seen this a lot in bridges. The good thing about this system, we call this also box girder or bath tub, that you can just come here and then put the bridge deck is going to be like this. And of course, you're going to have some rebars that stick this way, right? You're going to have rebars that come, that's coming this way. You have some dials. It's going to be coming running like this. And also, they say alternate dial. What does it mean by alternate dial? Which means that you're going to have some other dial doing this. So one time you bring it right, one time you bring it left, and then you put the reinforcing for the deck, and then you put the concrete top in here. And of course, this is going to help you out because it works also as a formwork. So what you need to do is just put some form in here, inside. You see here, this piece, this lid, is to put the formwork. You put the formwork, you can just leave it there. You don't need to take it out. It is not hurting anyone. And you just pour the concrete there. The good thing about this system here, it looks nice from outside. So you don't see all of this, right? You don't see a few girders like this. You're going to see just a clean space here. And also this is good because you can run here some ducts and pipelines and everything that you'd like to run in electrical conduits for lighting and the whole thing. Everything is going to be inside here. So no one's going to see it. And from time to time, you're going to see an access hole from the side of the bridge girder here. You're going to see maybe an access hole from here or from some place. So for maintenance, you can get in and do their work. Same yeah. thing. I've seen homeless people living in there. They'll like climb in there and build a home inside. Really? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I like thought inside. I thought you're, just, you're just doing a joke here. And oh, yeah, inside this bathtub, they'll go in through the access hole and they'll light little fires and like the wow. whole. Do you think is the bridge room inside of the of the light of fire? You know. Mm -hmm. This. It, 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 it's a bad idea, yeah. <laughs> it is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> but how would they climb? I mean, this is, unless the bridge is really low at one of the locations, right? You just yeah, yeah. And the the holes. They always go in through the access holes. Yeah, I mean, this is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know that concrete, I mean, if you light a fire here, the, the problem is the concrete cover, it may not be enough, and you can hurt all the strands, you know? The steel loses lots of the strength if it's supposed to fire. Yeah, that's, yeah, exactly. It's disasters. Yep. It uh, costs, costs a lot of money. Yeah, and how would you get them out? How would you shift them inside? <laughs> yeah, call the police, I guess. <laughs> no, but how would the police chase them inside? I mean, somebody's <laughs> going to go in the bridge and just walk, right? <laughs> yeah. You need to go exactly. and look for him. Okay. And look at the size, same designation. And this is going to be your variable. Some, some dimensions going to be fixed, and some of it's going to be variable, and you have all the information. And look at this system here. Part of it's going to be pre-tension, which means all the strands here. And some of it's going to be options, going to be for post-tension ducts, right? They just leave it for you. The precaster is going to leave it, and you can run the post-tension strands in here, and you can just do your analysis for the post-tension and pre-tension, which is, makes it kind of a little bit complex when it comes to analysis. Look at this one. Now this becomes four feet and look how, how big is this? You have lots of, I mean, this gave you the light range, lots of strands here. And of course you have the same table. So you have tables for everything. It's giving the beautiful thing about this uh, uh, priesthood thing that you have tables with all the information. Look at this post tension, the light range, PT, and then you have this post tension. You see here when it says PT, it doesn't mean priestess, it means post tension. And look at this. They can give you this with that, and they can give you this width. But once you add here some PT, uh, like ducts, the width is gonna be a little bit different. And it is gonna be having here this designation PT at the end of it. Okay, good, great. Also, we have this voided slabs. You know, the voided slabs, this is how the California Decathlon design specifications recognize it. We call it like holocores, if you like. This is the name that we use. We call it blanks, but here it's called voided slabs and bridges. 
um, some locations, you just go with this system because the span is small and you don't really need to put any of these girders or the bed top, you don't really need that. Uh, other shapes that you may see, you may see something like this. They call this delta, which is very similar to the bed top, but it is going to be very squeezed here from the bottom. Sometimes you see it to be completely like like rectangular section, which is fine. And sometimes it looks like double T. It's going to be very similar to double T. But this is going to be also for small bridges. You don't really use it in big bridges. It's going to be for small, small ones. Same thing that we have learned at the beginning, what happens? You have the girder, you're going to put here the pretension force or the pre-stress force and look what happens. You put here, I mean, due to just the self-weight because at the beginning you have the self-weight and the pre-stressing. So due to the self-weight, you're going to have here the weight divided by the section modulus. At the bottom, you're going to have tension. Top, you're going to have compression. This is going to be one load source. The second one, you have just axial compression as if this PT force happened at the CG. This is going to be P over A for the pre-stress. And then from the eccentricity of the PT cable or the pre-tension cable to the CG, you're going to have P times E P is giving the pre-stressing force times the eccentricity divided by section modulus. And due to that, you're going to have your compression at the bottom and tension at the top. This gave you the load sources or the action sources. Now you add them all up together and then you do the stress here in the top. Most likely you're going to end up with some tension at the beginning. And most likely you're going to have your compression at the bottom. And this gave you like the initial case. They call this here stage one which means for us, that was the I case, an instantaneous case or initial. And here you need to keep the stress within certain limits and tension, and the compression also is going to be kept within certain limits. Here are the limits. Don't forget that the that Catherine's design specifications or design manual is following the ASH2. And the ASH2 usually follows an old version of the ACI code. Now, if you like here to see the most recent code, it's gonna be the ACI 314 used here in construction. And you're gonna see here the limits is kind of a little bit different. Expectation at one point, ASH2 is gonna be changing their design equations in concrete and pre-stress and try to follow the ACI. And of course, Catherine's is gonna be following you. Now, after this, in stage 2A, you're going to be putting here the concrete deck. So now you take the stresses from the first stage. Now this concrete is cast. It is hardened. So the stresses are locked. You see what happened here? The stresses are locked. You have already some stresses, tension at the top, compression at the bottom. You just take it from here. Now you start here to add the weight of the slab, which means this is going to be the addition of the load. And then here we go. At the end, you need to check the stresses. So this is going to be stage 2A. Now, previously, when we were doing the analysis, we just, we have taken the stresses here and we just added the stresses very similar to that, but we added also the life load. But here we're going to do it in phases or in stages, okay? What happened later on? I'm gonna have in here, the stress is taken from stage 2A, now I'm moving here to stage 2B. Now the concrete deck is hardened, which is something new. And they'd like to use the concrete deck in the strength of the entire beam, which is very tricky here issue. This is nothing that we have discussed before. And this gave be very tricky for us that we need to know how to handle it. When I calculate out the stresses here, top and bottom, in stage one, there is no concrete topping. And the section was just like this. 
And all the stresses would just based on this section. When I did stage 2A, this concrete was not hardened yet. Am I correct? This concrete stress is not there. And the section depth is going to be from here to there. And look at the stress distribution. It says here compression and tension. Compression and compression. Where? Only on the girder section. Concrete topping was not included, which means the concrete depth. But look at what happened here. Now this concrete here becomes integral part of this girder. Now they work together. So the previous stresses that you calculated out here has been locked into the concrete. Now, when you apply the additional dead load, any additional dead load, besides the weight of the girder and the weight of the concrete deck, what's going to happen is going to be considering the entire strength and moment of inertia of the girder and the concrete deck with it. So in this case, you're going to have new properties. It's not going to be the same section models, not the same moment of inertia, because now moment of inertia is going to be including the concrete deck with it. And in this case here, look at the stress distribution. The stresses here is going to show moment of the slab. This is going to be just the moment due to the concrete deck. And you divide it here by S, which is the addition of the loop. So all of a sudden, the stress is going to show up in the concrete deck. Because now the section becomes deeper and becomes stronger. So the initial stresses here is going to be based on the bare beam without any concrete deck. Once you add the additional dead load, and the additional dead load in this case is going to include piping, maybe ducts, maybe other loads, not the concrete slab. So in bridges, instead of having just dead load and superimposed dead load on life load, like what we have, let's say, in precast construction, like for buildings, in here, we're going to have more steps that we need to check for. Here, we have the self weight. And then we have the diaphragm and deck. What's diaphragm and deck? Which means a concrete deck here, right? And then we have the additional dead load. And then we have also the life load. So look here what happened again. Once we start here, the additional dead load. So when we added the diaphragm and deck, right? Which means the weight of the slab. We didn't consider the strength of it because it's still wet. But once you add here the addition dead load, guess what happened? Now we need to consider the entire moment of inertia and the entire stiffness of the beam or the girder with the concrete deck. Now the deck starts here to take some stresses, but it's not taking any of the pre-stressing stresses. So the stress is due to the pre-stress force and the self-weight is not reflected on the deck. It doesn't go to the deck because it's already locked in and taken by the bare beam only. Now it becomes more complex, right? Guess what happened here for the life load? Now you can take the stresses here from the previous case and start to add to it. Now here's the life load. Now when you add the life load, as you see here, it's gonna be considered the entire moment of inertia and the stiffness of the girder and the concrete deck. Now we add this stress distribution to this, and here we go. Here's the stress distribution that you're gonna have. Each case here in the surface level, you need to keep the tension within certain limit and also the compression within certain limits. Any questions on this discussion about having the life load in stage three, having just additional dead load? You have here stage two A and two B and the idea of locking the stresses within the bare beam or girder and then adding more loads to it, now the slab is gonna be helping in resisting it. Any questions? So it it yeah. just requires some sort of like, cause you can't cast them Obviously, it's not done monolithically, right? So you have to. No, no, this is the, here. Like, like yeah. if you remember our right, yeah, pre or precast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This gonna be all precast. And so then say 90%, of the deck is gonna be cast in place. So you have to use the reinforcement with like the hooks that I asked about, I guess, earlier, right? Like, like this discussion here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And so. so at the beginning, this girder here just support itself and support the pre-stressing. 
and the stress calculations can be based on this without adding the concrete deck. Now, once you add the concrete deck, this can be also put in the concrete deck. Concrete deck is gonna still wet, stay wet. I mean, as long as wet doesn't take any, any stresses. Now, right. once it become hardened, you add life loads, it's gonna be going to the intersection for bottom to the deck in this. Got it, okay, yeah, okay, I think I'm understanding. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so you say, how about the stresses? Uh, we need to understand the difference between harping and draping. So harping is to do this. Let's say here's a girder. You just come here from one end. This gonna be harping, right? It's gonna be something like this. And draping is gonna be like when you do it like in curvature. What's the good thing about harping or draping? I'm going to say, I mean, instead of having just a straight line like this, you remember the straight line here, the straight strand, like what you were talking here about? That the problem here actually is going to happen at the end. So it is good when you have this at the bottom, at the center of the beam or the girdle. But the problem is going to happen once you get to the end. Because here you have some moment. You have some applied moment and this moment. Let's say this, this uh, strand here is going to be causing here compression, top is going to be tension. And the applied load on it is going to be causing here compression, here's tension. So it counteracts the effect of the pre stressing. But the problem is going to happen here at the end. At the end, applied moment is going to be equal to zero. You'd rather maybe bring this up a little bit to the CG if you can, but it means more expense. It's going to be more cost in the fabrication yard. Because in order for you to keep this on the top, just imagine that you're going to start here from this point and go like this, right? Now you're going to start to apply tension. So what's going to happen, this trend here, it wants to lift up. So you need to keep it down. You need to do something like this. You need to have a mechanism, right? And then you need to anchor it to the floor in a couple of points. This going to be one point, and here's going to be another point. So once you start to apply tension here, now you want to pull this up, which means an expense. This is going to be a cost to keep this in place, right? So you'd like to avoid this as possible if you can. And the problem when you keep here, this amount of eccentricity, it means that you're going to hear lots of tensile stresses and you need to put additional reinforcing. So you have the cost of anchoring this down and draping it, draping the cable or hardening it, or would you like here to add more reinforcing? This gave you the dilemma, right? And then you need to answer this question, which one's cheaper, which one's available to you, which one you're good with as a fabricator. You see here, we have what is good about hardening or draping is gonna be more efficient for the flexural design. Whenever you need this eccentricity in the strands, you have it. You control the stress, the stress is especially at the end. And the shear strength also is increased. And we're not at the shear strength yet design. Give me a second. back sorry for that um just imagine when you have here your girder and you are putting this happening or doing this you know the direction of the shear cracks you know the shear cracks is going to be happening like this right when you have shear cracks shear cracks is going to be like in this direction And you have two options here. Either the cable is going to be draped or it's going to be straight like this. In a case like this, you put here compression to close the cracks. This is going to be helping the shear strength. 
And here you don't really do any of that because compression is going to be in the middle and actually you're going to be increasing the opening of the shear cracks, the potential to it. Why? Because look at this. If I may go back here. If shear cracks is going to happen, it's going to happen this way, right? So here you are putting more tension to open these cracks. But in a case like this, look at the shear cracks. It's going to be like this. And this is helping it. You see, the strand here is helping to close it. So actually, the shear strength is increased by having this hardening in this type of um, uh, this type of profiles. So if I have a straight profile, I'd rather have it this way, and this can help a lot in shear strength. The bad thing about it is going to be the cost. I mean, this is going to cost you some money and safety because what happened here for this anchor is just going to go up if it just fails, right? Someone here can get killed easily. So you better be securing this and be sure this is really safe. Here is some of the, of the mechanism that they use. You have here, you see the jack because at the beginning, you can have the strain the straight and then you need to pull it down. And this can be expensive here. This is some cost here that goes with it. And here's some pictures for it. Don't forget, you don't have just one strain. You're going to have a few of them. And this is here, it happens for bulk T. You see this? So you need to bring this down, which is going to be a cost here. They call this hold down, very similar to the same that we use, the same name, you know, that used for hold downs in lightweight construction. Also, the debonding. Debonding means that you're going to put the strand within like a sleeve and instead of having a bond between the concrete and between the strand. There's good things about this. And there's also bad things about this. Transfer of the force usually happens at the end. So when you have this debonding, you are reducing the stresses at the end of this member. It's going to be much simpler. You know, when you debond it, it means that you're going to be just trying to sleep and later on like the duct. What duct? It's going to be something like this duct that I was talking about, the post-tensioning duct. You know, all of these ducts. You can just do it later on. So you have this flexibility in construction. But if you don't have this ducts, I mean, it is not going to be that simple, right? You need to be sure about location and the fabrication yard, about the amount of tension force, right? Good thing also about the ducts that you don't need this hold down. This is only in pre-tension. So instead of doing this hold down system, and all of these forces and all the safety issues, you can just run a duct like this. Just run the duct and secure it in place, pour the concrete. What do you do later on? You come, you run the strand inside, and then what do you do? You start to apply the tension. Now what's gonna keep this in place? I'm gonna see the concrete itself. Concrete itself is gonna be keeping this duct in place. Here's a strand debonding. You see, you can do the sheeting or you can do a sleeve. It's like plastic sheeting that you run around the cable. And here's the end. It's going to be from one end to the other end. So in many cases, instead of just running a duct, you can bring the strand, you wrap it. It comes wrapped in many cases, like in, in shielded, or you can wrap it yourself. And then you put it in the concrete beam. You run from the one end to the other end, and you drape it the way you want it, you secure it to the rest of the rebars and ties, and you pour the concrete. And then you do later on, you do the post tensioning to it. So this also can be done. We have here three major precast bridge types. We have precast pre-tension girders, and we have some recommended span, very similar to the table that we have. We have also the post tension, Splice girder. This is when you are going to have pieces of the girder. You are going to put it all together. So you have it precast, and then you bring it to the site, and then you start to assemble and put them together, which is the same as this segmented girder. This segmented girder is very famous. I'm sure that you guys have seen it, uh, like this bridge that was running in the uh, in the port of Inde. And it goes up to 400 feet. And then you have some spacing. 
you see here, we have uh, a nice picture. This may be for single span, this for some I beam. And you just take it and then you're dropping down. So you're gonna say I beam, but I look here at the end, it does look like an I beam. You say, if you cut the section here, it's gonna be looking like an I beam. But the end block P is because this is where all the force is gonna get transferred to the concrete. You see here, they make it a solid piece. So this solid piece for a reason. It's gonna have here more ties and it's gonna have highly compressive forces at the end and transferable forces is gonna happen at the end. As you see here, you have a bunch of delts, it just sticks up. And what you need to do after you put this in place and you see here, here's the first girder, space another girder, a third girder, fourth girder. And then all of the three bars get be bent right and left at certain height, and then you add the reinforcing bars for the concrete deck, and then you pull the concrete deck later on. When you have more than one span, like continuous, I guess here you're gonna have some trouble because you have your negative moment and positive moment. And right at the column bend, and the column bend means the support, you need to have good solid section because you're going to have high compressive stress in the top and the bottom. This is unlike precast parking structures. This one here usually has a continuity. You cannot have it as simply support from one piece to another piece. So what happens usually, you come, let's say, here's a girder, like a system. See what happened here? This is gonna be simply supported. Just an I-beam appear, or a bend, and then another I-beam, there's no continuity. And the cap here is drop. It is just below both of these two girders. So the drop cap, we call this drop cap. It's like this. Here's a section through it, like an elevation. It chooses the two girders. They're coming here to one point. We have some spacing for the expansion, for the thermal expansion. And here, what you have, you have this continuous cap. This gives you drop cap and then supported, let's say, on pipes. If you like to see here some continuity, you need to have this. This gives you a drop cap, as you see here. But look what happened. This section here is going to be concrete, is going to be cast in place. And in a case like this, you can provide the continuity for the drip, for the strength. It's gonna be throughout the top of the girder. So two complete different systems. Here's gonna be simply supported, like in this case here. Simply supported, simply support girder. They sit on a cap, and then you have here some supports, and you have this expansion joint, if you like, which means this area here, this section, the gap. But in a case like this, now this becomes here one big part because look what happened. You see this dashed line, it's gonna be all poured in concrete. And there's gonna be some continuity here in the strands. So here you're gonna have some ducts for the strands, for the post tension. They're gonna be running the cable or the strands throughout. And the cable in this case is giving the top because this is where you need the moment in the middle of the beam or the girder, give you the bottom, and then you just drape it. So here provides you the negative moment capacity that you are looking for. This can be called here inverted T cap and look what happened. Also, you can provide here the continuity if you want to. So the good thing about this is give you the clear overhead. So if you have an overhead here problem, this depth or this ledge is gonna provide you what you need because you are pushing here the cap, you are gonna push it up. So look what happened here to this girder. The girl is going to have a kind of a cut, and this cut is going to be an issue when it comes to shear strength because you can just fail it at this section here, which means the depth of this and the shear strength here is going to be limited. So you got to be careful about a design like this. Shear is going to be an issue. But it's kind of concealed because you don't really here see a cab. Once you go here to the bottom, this is going to be kind of flush. Any questions? All right, with that, I'm done for today and I can let you go.
uh, enjoy the spring break. And um, finish your submittal. And if you have any questions, please feel free to send me an email. And if you need to meet via Zoom, I'm going to be also open. We can just, you know, uh, you can send me an email. We can set a time for a meeting if you like.